Father, you have called us out from the world to be your holy people. You have called us out from our busy lives to this moment of your holiness, to give us your gifts, to send us your Holy Spirit as you have promised. Here, Lord, we ask that according to your word, you would come among us, that you would fill us with your spirit, your word, with faith, and with love and zeal which flow forth from it, that we might follow you on the way to eternal life, ever fixing our eyes on Jesus Christ, our Savior, and growing every day in grace and holiness. <coughs> we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Our opening hymn this morning is hymn 904. <laughs> Thank 
confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in our thoughts, words, and deeds, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your presence and eternal punishment. But for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Amen. Almighty God, in his mercy, has given his Son to die for you, and for his sake forgives you all your sins. As a called and ordained servant of Christ, and by his authority, I therefore forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continue with the intro, after which we'll speak the glory of God. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you, and you shall glorify me. With my whole heart I cry. Answer me, O Lord. I will keep your statutes. I call to you, save me, that I may observe your testimonies. I rise before dawn and cry for help. I hope in your words. My eyes are set, are, are awake before the watches of the night, that I may meditate on your promise. Hear my voice according to your steadfast love. O Lord, according to your justice, give me life. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have mercy. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God. And for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, Lord have, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Testament reading this morning is from Genesis chapter 18, verses 20 through 33. 
Then the Lord said, because the outcry against Sodom and Gomorrah is great and their sin is very grave, I will go down to see whether they have done altogether according to the outcry that has come to me. And if not, I will know. So the men turned from there and went towards Sodom. But Abraham still stood before the Lord. Then Abraham drew near and said, Will you indeed sweep away the righteous with the wicked? Suppose there are 50 righteous within the city. Will you then sweep away the place and not spare it for the 50 righteous who are in it? Far be it from you to do such a thing, to put the righteous to death with the wicked, so that the righteous fare as the wicked. Far be that from you. Shall not the judge of all the earth do what is just? And the Lord said, If I find at Sodom 50 righteous in the city, I will spare the whole place for their sake. Abraham answered and said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord, I who am but dust and ashes. Suppose five of the fifty righteous are lacking. Will you destroy the whole city for lack of five? And he said, I will not destroy it if I find forty-five there. Again, he spoke to him and said, Suppose forty are found there. He answered, For the sake of forty, I will not do it. And then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak. Suppose 30 are found there. He answered, I will not do it if I find 30 there. He said, Behold, I have undertaken to speak to the Lord. Suppose 20 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 20, I will not destroy it. Then he said, Oh, let not the Lord be angry, and I will speak again but this once. Suppose 10 are found there. He answered, For the sake of 10, I will not destroy it. And the Lord went his way. When he had finished speaking to Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We'll read Psalm 138 responsively. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted above all things your name and your word. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul you increase. All the kings of the earth shall give you thanks, O Lord. For they have heard the words of your mouth. And they shall sing of the ways of the Lord. For great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord is high, he regards the lowly. The body he knows from afar. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve my life. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. Our epistle lesson is from Colossians 2, verses 6 through 19. Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith, just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. See to it that no one takes you captive by philosophy and empty deceit according to human tradition, according to the elemental spirits of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him the whole fullness of deity dwells bodily, and you have been filled in him, who is the head of all rule and authority. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you, who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with his legal demands. This he set aside nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the rulers and authorities and put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. Therefore, let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. These are a shadow of things to come, but the substance belongs to Christ. Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels 
detail about visions puffed up about reason by his sensuous mind and not holding fast to the head from whom the whole body nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments grows with a growth that is from God. This is the word of the Lord. Please arise for the gospel reading. Alleluia, I tell you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. Alleluia. Alleluia, Lord, to whom shall we go? have the words of eternal life. Alleluia. The Holy Gospel according to St. Luke, the 11th chapter. Glory to you, o Lord. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And he said to them, which of you who has a friend will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves for a friend of mine has arrived on a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, do not bother me. The door is now shut and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. What father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? This is the Gospel of the Lord. Please be seated. We'll sing hymn 766, verses 1 through 3 and 5. 1 through 3 and 5.
We pray. Lord, to whom else shall we go? You alone have the words of eternal life. Amen. Dearly beloved, bought and cleansed and invited to pray through the blood of Jesus Christ, our Savior, grace and peace to you. It is obvious that you need to pray. It is obvious from your flesh's condition. It is obvious from your sin. It is obvious from the invitation of Jesus. It is obvious in our text from the fact that Jesus prays. From the fact that the disciples, experienced Christians, asked Jesus to teach them to pray when they had already once been taught to pray by John. They eagerly desired this thing. And so must you. So should you. For it is a great thing. It is true that as Christians, there's a sense in which you automatically pray. The scriptures teach us that at all times the Holy Spirit intercedes for us with groans too deep for words. You don't have to learn how to do that. It's also true that there are simple prayers we pray all the time, and those are well and good as, as well. But there is also a very important kind of prayer that Jesus encourages us to learn, to practice, to do. And the Lord's Prayer is the perfect way to teach us to do it. You will notice that when Jesus responds to the disciples, he says, when you pray, literally what he says is whenever you pray. That doesn't mean that you have to use these exact words. You might have noticed that these aren't even the exact same words that are recorded in Matthew's version of the Lord's Prayer. What Jesus does mean, though, is that this is the perfect template to learn to pray. And that when you pray, if you use this as the frame to hang all your prayers on, you will be able to cover everything you could possibly need to pray about. And you will be able to do so confidently. You know, everywhere the scriptures speak about prayer, they encourage two basic things, two attitudes, two, two ways that we should have of praying. And that is to pray deeply and boldly. Jesus illustrates both of those in our text. The Lord's Prayer itself is teaching us to pray deeply. And the illustrations he uses teach us to pray boldly. For instance, James in his epistle says, let him who asks, ask in faith without doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea. That person should not expect to receive anything from the Lord. In other words, what James is saying is when you pray, if you are not praying for things that you are certain God will give you, you shouldn't really expect that he will give you anything at all. But how can that be? How can we pray for only Always things that we know God will give us. I mean, we know that there are things that we might pray for that we don't know that he will give us. The answer to have that boldness that he's talking about is to be able to pray deeply, to be able to dig into God's word like the Lord's prayer here, which is God's word to us before it is our prayer to him, and learn from it what things we can pray for, what things we can demand from God in every single situation. So what I'd like to do is first talk about those two concepts, to pray deeply and boldly, briefly, and then apply them as we go through the petitions. First, to pray deeply. Obviously, it's the opposite of praying shallowly. Shallow prayer is all about me. First of all, shallow prayer is all about asking for the things that I want. Just me. It's about praying for things for myself alone. And you'll notice that in the Lord's Prayer, there is no such petition. Never will you find the words I, me, or mine, but only you, your, and our. Notice that doesn't mean you aren't praying for things for yourself. All of these are prayers for yourself as well, but it isn't only for you. The Lord's Prayer is a prayer to God and a prayer in Christ and a prayer for the church, of which you gladly are a part. The second way in which prayer can be shallow is when it is based on my ideas, my will, when sometimes we think that prayer is about getting God to change towards my will and not towards his. You notice Abraham's prayer in our text might seem like that's what he's doing, but it's not. Abraham is so bold to pray to God for what he is asking because he knows that what he is asking for is God's will. He said to him, this is not like you. It would not be like you, God, to throw away, to destroy the righteous along with the wicked. And that's why he is asking. In prayer, we are submitting our will to God's. 
and learning to pray for the, prayer, the things that he has given us and taught us to pray for. The third way in which prayer can be shallow is when it is based on me. You guys probably heard the joke or seen the, the motif in a movie where you know somebody's in trouble, they're not really a very religious person, they'll say something like, you know, God, I've not been a really religious person, and I've not always been a very good person, but you know, God, if you'll do this thing for me, then, then I'll dedicate my life to you. There's the old joke, there's a guy, he's, he's like a mile out at sea, and he's trying to swim back to the shore, and he's like, God, if you'll let me make it, I'll, I'll dedicate the rest of my life to you, and then he makes it halfway, he says, God, God, if you let me make it, I'll dedicate half my life to you. And then he gets, he's a quarter of the way left, and he says, God, if you let me make it, I'll dedicate, uh, uh, you know, 10 years to you. And he gets to shore, and he says, thanks, God, and keeps walking. That's the way the world thinks about prayer. It's sort of a bargaining thing, right? I've got something, God, that you want. I've got something to offer you. Or I've done something, which means that you should listen to me. That's shallow prayer. It's a kind of prayer that God won't listen to at all. We cannot pray on the basis of me, but on the basis of Jesus. That's why he teaches us to pray, Father, the same way that he does, the same way that Jesus called God Father. You can address God in the exact same way because through faith in Jesus, in your baptism, you stand in relation to God in the exact same place as Jesus. Forgiven, redeemed, holy through his blood and made God's own son or daughter. Eager. I mean, just think about your own parents. You're far more likely to ask your parents for things than you are to ask other people for things, aren't you? You're far more comfortable talking to them and asking them for things than you would be with some stranger. So also, God desires you to view him in the same way through Jesus Christ. Eager and bold, come to him on the basis of Jesus. So deep prayer is entirely based on Jesus. It's based on digging into what he has promised. It's based on coming to God because of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. And that deep prayer allows you to pray boldly, just as the illustrations show. Because you know, first of all, that God will hear. That's why he has this story about the friend. It's kind of an interesting story. There's actually a couple different takes on it. But I think the simplest way to view it is imagine that you're that guy who's already gone to bed. You've turned the lights out, you've locked the doors, your kids are in bed, you're in bed. Somebody comes knocking at the door. Dude, can I get some food? I got a friend who's coming to town. Now, it's important to remember that people back then took hospitality extremely seriously, and it was the duty of everyone involved, but still, you're in bed, and you don't really want to get up, and you don't really want the children to wake up. But if your neighbor just keeps knocking and asking, you're going to give him what he wants to make him go away. If for no other reason, just to make him go away because no one's going to get any sleep until he does. Jesus says, well, if that's true, if that impudence, if that persistence is going to get that guy what he wants from his friend for no other reason than the impudence, how much more is God going to give you what you ask for when you pray persistently? And you can pray persistently when you pray boldly, when you pray deeply. To God for the Spirit on the basis of Jesus Christ. And that brings us to the other illustration. Jesus uses a startling image. And everybody who is listening to him would be like, well, of course, of course I wouldn't give my child a serpent instead of a fish or a scorpion instead of an egg. There's no way I would do that. Jesus says, you're right. Even though you are evil, and know what he says there. He does say you, all of you, are evil. He's talking about our sinful nature. Yet, you still know how to give this bare minimum of a good gift of food to your children. Well, then how much more will the Heavenly Father give what is good? And notice what he says. He says, give the Holy Spirit. What he is teaching us about prayer right there is that the good gift, the good answer to every deep and bold prayer is the Holy Spirit. In, in essence, the answer to all of these petitions we're going to look at is the Holy Spirit. So let's see how that applies. He says, Father, hallowed be your name. For something to be holy is for it to be set apart, to be sacred, to be special, to be different, because it has a special purpose. This is why God is so serious about his name. As we heard in our intro today, he says, call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you will glorify me. 
Some of you might have piggy banks at home, You're storing away money, kids, for some future purpose. If you break that piggy bank and spend all the money on candy, because you feel like it, it won't be there later one day for some other special thing you might want to use it for. So with God's name, he wants his name to be set apart and holy for us. God's name, as Luther writes in his explanation of his petition, is always holy in itself. No one can actually make God's name not holy, but they can make it not holy for themselves. And that extends from everything like flippantly saying things like OMG to swearing in other ways, to false doctrine, and to unholy living. Because notice the connection here. If we're calling God Father, as his children through baptism, his name is on us. His name alone saves us. His name hallows you. It sets you apart from the world. It makes you holy through the blood of Jesus Christ because you are baptized into that name and join one with him. It then also reflects on him in your life. The things that you do as his children are meant to be a reflection of God's holiness. And that's also why we have to start with this. Just as in a little bit, we will pray specifically for forgiveness. That is also at the heart of this first petition. Hallowed be your name. Hallowed be your name to me in my salvation with the forgiveness of sins. And from that forgiveness for all the ways in which we have failed to live holy lives, that we would then grow in holiness, reflecting on God and the way that we live. We, of course, are also then praying for God's word, for the pure teaching of that word among us. So... How do we pray this prayer deeply and boldly in different situations in our lives? Well, when you're facing some decision, maybe a day-to-day -day decision, maybe a big decision, like where you're going to live, what job you're going to have, pray this prayer and consider, in this decision, how can I hallow God's name? How can I show the world the holiness of God's name? How can I support and defend and uphold the true teaching of God's word. For instance, if I choose to go to school or go to live in a place where there is no one teaching God's word and its truth and purity, am I choosing to hallow God's name for myself and my family? Or am I making my decision for some other priority? If I choose to live the way the world does today, am I hallowing God's name? Or am I destroying it in the eyes of the world? Pray deeply, pray boldly, that God's name be hallowed and that God's kingdom come. God's kingdom is God's reign. That's what the word means. It doesn't refer to a place. It doesn't even specifically refer to a people. It refers to an activity, the ruling activity of the king, and that's Jesus. Because God has given all things into Jesus' own almighty hands. He is the shepherd. He is the king. He is the Savior. Everything that Jesus does is the kingdom of God. When we pray this petition, then think how deeply and widely we are praying. We are praying for exactly what, first of all, Jesus has already done. That's why Jesus, through John the Baptist and himself and his preaching and through his disciples, preached, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, because Jesus was there, active, because he was casting out demons and healing the sick and preaching the good news of the kingdom. The kingdom of God is Jesus keeping the law for you. It is Jesus dying on the cross where above his head it was written the king of the Jews. It is Jesus rising from the dead and thereby resting the crown from death's pale brow and placing it upon his own head as Lord and Savior and Prince of life. When you pray for God's kingdom to come, you are praying also for the preaching of the gospel throughout the world. Because that is how God delivers people from the domain of darkness and brings them into the kingdom of his beloved son. You are praying for his return at the end of all things, that he would bring his kingdom in forever. In that new heavens and new earth where righteousness will dwell, and we will dwell with him. All of this you pray for in this petition. How do we pray it deeply and boldly? Well, again, in your decisions. How can God's kingdom come? How can you work in the kingdom? Not only that, but let's say you're facing some great difficulty, some tragedy, some sickness. And the 
family from death. Pray your kingdom come. Not, Lord, why would you let this happen to me? But, Lord, how will you use this to bring your kingdom to me and through me to others? Think of some friend you have, some acquaintance who doesn't know about the Lord, and pray, your kingdom come to this person. And help me to say the words, to bring it to them. Lord, when I face death, help me to pray, your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus. When you're overwhelmed by the wickedness of the world, pray, come quickly, Lord Jesus. All of these are the prayer that Jesus teaches here. And also the next, give us each day our daily bread. It might seem at first like in some ways this is kind of the shallowest of the prayers, but of course that is not true at all. It begins, of course, as the prayer by which we ask for all the things that God gives us in this life. The first article gifts, you might say. House and home and food and clothing and shoes and all the many blessings besides these that God gives. You'll notice that he says, give us to say our daily bread and not our daily steak. We're asking for what we need to survive, and yet he often gives us far more besides that. You'll also notice that it says daily, literally each day, give us each day the bread we need for today. It reminds me of what is written in the Proverbs. Give me neither riches nor poverty. Feed me with the food that is needful for me. He is teaching us not to live our lives piling up gold like a dragon's hoard, but rather to live generously, to live in the present, to live trustingly. Not worried about the past because the past is forgiven. Not worried about the future because it rests in God's hands but to live trusting God each day for whatever you need for that day. Remember in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus talks about not worrying about tomorrow. If you've got kids, you've probably heard something like this. What are we going to do tomorrow? Where are we going to go tomorrow? What are we going to do that's fun tomorrow? What are we going to eat tomorrow? And you're like, I don't know. I'm thinking about today. God encourages us to live that way. A day at a time, a day at a time in his grace. And thus teaches us not only to trust in him for whatever we need for that day, but also to be those by whom he brings daily bread to others. Because this is why he gives you what you have. To provide for you and to provide for others, whether that's your children or your neighbor who comes knocking at your door in the middle of the night, like in Jesus' story. The people you meet who are in need, like the Good Samaritan that we had a few weeks ago. But there's also even more. See, when we realize that Jesus is promising here to give us what we need for our earthly life, while we are in this life, it also begs the question, why? And what about after that? It is because, of course, that God cares for you in body and soul, because his son Jesus Christ came into this world and redeemed you, body and soul. That he suffered in the flesh. That he was tempted with hunger. And during that temptation said, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of the Lord. And that he himself is that bread. The bread of life. The one who gives you life. Not just for this world, but for the world to come. And the fact that God desires to preserve your life in this world is a reminder that he has given you life eternal through Jesus Christ. And given you the bread that never fails. For whoever eats of this bread, by faith believing in Jesus Christ, will never die and live on to that eternal age, to that eternal day. And so we pray, forgive us our sins. As we also, for we also ourselves, forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Everywhere where the Bible teaches the forgiveness of sins, it teaches us to tie it together with our forgiving of others. And that is because forgiveness is the currency of the kingdom of God. It is what he gives freely to us. And in giving it freely to us, he opens our hearts to give it freely to others. And so the petitions that we pray deeply and boldly from this are fairly obvious. Whenever you have sin, of course, you pray this. And of course, it needs to be prayed every day. The fact that the previous petition says each day our daily bread proves that it's a petition you should be praying every day, right? And that in turn proves that this too is a petition you should be praying every day because every day you have sins. Every day you fail to trust in him. Every day you, are, you fail to be generous. Every day you fail to hallow God's name. And every day you forget to focus on the things of his kingdom. So here it is. To mop it all up. To bring it all to God and say, forgive us our sins. All of them. You don't have to name every single one. 
all of our sins as a lump placed on Jesus Christ on the cross. Forgive us. And then when you find bitterness in your heart, you find anger at what someone else has done to you, this again is a petition to pray. Forgive us our sins. Forgive us our sins of bitterness and unforgiveness, Lord, because of how you have forgiven us. And from that, teach us to forgive one another. He always ties them together because it is such a constant problem that we have, a failure to forgive as we have been forgiven, a failure to realize that the things other people have done to us, the debts they owe us, are nothing compared to the debts that we have owed to God which he has forgiven. And by praying them together, he always brings us back to the source of forgiveness, the only way which we can in turn forgive others. And that brings us to the last petition, lead us not into temptation. It is interesting that Jesus, it is said, was led into temptation. Right after his baptism, the Holy Spirit led Jesus into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. It's like he's saying, kids, don't try this at home. He's the champion. Go in there in your place. Conquering the devil for you. And because of this, because of his resisting temptation, because of his death, because of his resurrection, we can pray this prayer constantly. Deeply. It doesn't mean that you will not be tempted. Temptations must come because we are still in the flesh, because we are still beset by the world and by the devil. But as James says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God indeed tempts no one. Instead, in all of those temptations from the devil, from the world, from your flesh, God is providing the way out. And in providing the way out, he is seeking to turn the temptation into a test. A test by which he grows and strengthens your faith in him. And the way out is always the same. It is always Jesus who is tempted in your place. It is always his forgiveness. It is always his word. It is, in essence, all of the petitions we've just prayed. When you are tempted to dishonor God's name, there it is. Make me holy through your forgiveness and teach me to live in your holiness. Your kingdom come. When I am tempted to turn away from your kingdom, to doubt its power for my life or to bring to others, bring me back to your kingdom through your word. Give us each day our daily bread. When you are tempted with greed, when you are tempted with despair, when you are tempted with jealousy, when you are tempted with doubt because of various situations in your life, it's the answer. Jesus who provides your daily bread and gives you the life that never ends. And forgive us our sins when you're overcome with sin. That's really, that's really where the devil wants you. When the devil gets you to sin, he hasn't really accomplished all that much because Jesus has paid for everything. He's canceled the power of sin. The devil's goal is always to bring you either to pride and impenitence or to such a great guilt that he can convince you you are lost in black despair and no one could possibly love you or forgive you. And so forgive us our sins. Father, who has taken all our sins away in Jesus Christ, in all of these petitions, then you can pray deeply and boldly to God as your Father through Jesus Christ and for the Holy Spirit who is the good gift that the Father certainly will one of these petitions in all the particular ways that you need it each day. So pray this prayer. Pray it for everything. Pray it for everyone. Pray it deeply. Pray it boldly and in so doing, learn more and more how to pray. Through Jesus Christ, amen. And now the peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, amen. Please rise. We'll confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 
a holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We'll sing hymn 766, verses 6 through 9. We ask 
asked, Lord, that you would conquer the plans of the devil and the world and the flesh, that you would use all things for the good of your people, your church. We ask, Lord, for those among us that we have been asked to remember, for those who are sad or sick or weary or doubting or troubled. We ask in particular, Lord, for Don Bickham. We ask that you would give healing in his body according to your will, and most of all, Lord, as you have promised faith in you through Jesus Christ and a sure hope of everlasting life. We also ask for Kaylee Udy, that you would continue to bless her as she grows, that you would heal her in her body, and that you would constantly give her your Holy Spirit. We ask, Lord, also for all those who cannot be with us this morning, and for all of those that we remember before you, who are afflicted with any sort of trouble or doubt or sorrow, that you would comfort them with your holy word and with the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ. We ask, Lord, for our world. As Abraham once prayed for the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, that you might spare them even for ten righteous within. We ask, Lord, for this world, that you would spare us the sake of the one righteous Savior, Jesus Christ, as you have promised. And that through him, by faith in him, you might make many to be declared righteous through the forgiveness of sins. We ask all of these things, Lord, confident in your promises and trusting in you. And thus, we also join to pray the prayer that you have taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever. Please arise. We'll sing the offertory.